You're about to hear my response to a teaching by Costi Hinn called Can a Christian be Demon Possessed? For those who don't know, Costi Hinn is the nephew of the charismatic televangelist Benny Hinn, who is infamously known for his preaching of the prosperity gospel and of other false doctrines. Now, Costi has rejected his uncle's theology, and it would seem that these days he holds to a reformed cessationist viewpoint. With that, he doesn't hold to the typical charismatic deliverance ministry perspective that would support the belief that a Christian can have a demon and that we should be casting demons out of believers. And when Costi talks about demonization as seen in the Bible where demons inhabit people, he uses the term demon possession. So it would seem that he conflates the idea of demons owning a person and a demon inhabiting a person, which I'll address early on in this video. I'm going to interact with Costi's video by using clips from his teaching and then responding to them with segments from a teaching that I did called Can a Christian Have a Demon? A Complete Biblical Study. So we're going to start by watching the first clip of Costi's teaching and then we'll go from there. Also, don't forget to like this video, leave a comment and subscribe to this channel. In this short video, I want to answer some key questions about demons and then the ultimate question many wonder about, can a Christian be demon possessed? Can a Christian be demon possessed? The answer is absolutely not. The English translation of demon possession is often used to translate two different Greek terms. One is daimonizomai, and the other one, which I'm pretty sure I can pronounce correctly, is echian daimonion. In both cases, the demon resides in or inhabits the person. Daimonizomai describes someone being under the power or influence or control in varying degrees, varying degrees to an indwelling demon or evil spirit. The word is used 13 times in the New Testament, and it is only ever used in the Gospels. They did continue to cast demons out of people in the book of Acts, but this word is not used to describe people having demons um, in that, in that, from then onwards. The word diamondsmite does not necessarily the mean, mean the same as being owned by a demon. The words for ownership or possession are not used in the original text of the Bible to describe someone having demons. When people read the translation possessed, they think of the person either being owned by the demon or being under its total or direct control all the time. The idea being that the demon can do whatever it wants with the person, and that's not necessarily true of diamondsmite in every case. The word diamondsmite by itself does not mean that. Echian daimonion means have a demon or have a spirit. Um, an example of this, of the use of this phrase is in Acts chapter 16 to describe the condition of the girl with the spirit of divination in her, which Paul later casts out. It also It's also used in Luke chapter 8 verse 27 to describe the demoniac, how he had demons, which we know from the rest of the passage that the demons inhabited him. Um, this indicates to me that the term have a demon or demons refers to inhabitation. Other uses are found where John the Baptist and Jesus were wrongly accused of having a demon. In one of those instances, the Jews who falsely accused Jesus of having a demon because they thought he was insane, they associate, they associate, they did associate mental health issues with demons, but that doesn't mean all mental health issues are demonic, and it doesn't mean that if someone does have a demon, that it will always manifest itself through insanity. Um, also, the word daimonizomai was used in one of these instances interchangeably with echian daimonion, which indicates to me that when they accused John and Jesus of having a demon, they were accusing them of each having a demon inside them. So that was their understanding of what it meant to have a demon. It meant a demon was inside your body. The only other instance is in Luke chapter 13, verses 10 to 17, um, where it says there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. It never says Jesus cast the demons out of her. He just declared her freedom from the disability, laid his hands on her, and she was made straight. So we don't know for certain if the demons were in her, but I think based on the terminology and the fact the demon was affecting her spine, which is inside her body, it is reasonable to assume the demon was inside her. So I think when we look at Jesus' uh, deliverance ministry, we don't really see clear instances where we can say Jesus cast demons off people. It seems that when someone had a demon, it was always inside them in some sense. 
And Peter did say in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how Jesus went around healing all who were oppressed by the devil. But when we look at the Gospels and we see that the satanic oppression was through demons that inhabited people and Jesus healed them by casting the demons out. Though the scriptural authors may have intended that diamond edzimai indicates a slightly greater degree of demonic control than echian daimonion, translators are not justified in in rendering the term demon possession in the sense of being owned by the demon. This rendering signifies too much control. The Latin Vulgate Bible only used a term that meant to have a demon to describe demonization, but there was a a tradition in the Latin church of using the Latin term possessio to describe demonization. This then passed into ecclesiastical church language. This word means to occupy or control. The English word possession came from this, and this is probably how the word possession came to be used in English Bibles. The word possession was used and made popular in the 1611 Old King James Version of the Bible. Since then, it has been carried on into many Bible translations. It is important to note that while the modern meaning of possession can carry with it ideas of legal ownership, it is possible that the translators of the Old King James Bible didn't intend it to refer to ownership. The term possession has had a history of usage that refers to control or occupancy rather than ownership. Some deliverance ministers use the term demon-possessed, not intending it in the sense of ownership, as I said earlier. Um, I'm fine with that because I understand what they mean, but I personally prefer not to use that term because it can confuse people in our modern language. Unfortunately, this is probably why, if you look at many Greek lexicons, they define daimonidsomai as demon-possessed. Almost every contemporary writer prefers the term demonized in the sense of being inhabited by demons with varying degrees of influence, um, or just under the influence or power of a demon. However, there are theologians like Wayne Grudem who doesn't even like the term demonized because he thinks even then that's too much. To him, the word demonized describes extremely pervasive influence or control, like a total transformation rather than mild or moderate influence. Obviously, there are instances where the word diamond is used to describe situations like that, but in many instances, it's not that bad. It may be a mild to severe demonic influence, but it's not total transformation. So I may use the term demonized throughout this teaching, especially when I'm quoting other people, but they usually mean that in the broad sense of a person having demons inside them, not in the totally transformed sense that Grudem describes, although I sort of get where Grudem is coming from. A demon inhabits the person or is internalized. It can sometimes and in some instances interface or manifest through the faculties of the person, such as seeing through the eyes, uh, speak through the vocal cords, control psychomotor functions, control mental processes, or even potentially subject the person to a trance state of mental oblivion. However, I would hesitate to assume that means the demon owns the person or inhabits the core of their being. Even in some of the worst cases of demonization, the demon never totally controls the will of their host at all times. And that's another reason why I would say the term possession is not really suitable, because if they were possessed, the demon would control their will absolutely all the time, reducing them to a zombie-like state. In my subjective experience, and the experience of modern deliverance ministers, a demonized person can usually still discuss the condition of their soul, and they can still call to God for salvation. Even in the case of the man from Gadara who hung out at the tombs, who had a legion of demons, you know, he was naked, he broke chains and cut himself, he was severely demonized, and the demons exerted a very high level of control over him. But it's also not totally clear whether the demons had absolute control over him at all times. It does say after he was delivered, that he was in his right mind. Does that mean he was consistently out of his mind at every moment prior to his deliverance? Was it only at various times? Even if that were the case, I think the term possession would still be a wrong translation because that's not what the Greek word itself means. And I'll address this more later and throughout this teaching about demons taking direct control of people's bodies and whether that's the same as ownership. But for now, I want to continue focusing on our terminology and definitions. The theologian Wayne Grudem does not like the term demon-possessed for the same reasons I've described. He was part of the group that worked on ESV Bible translation, and he tried to get that term 
out of the translation entirely. He succeeded in every case except with the Gadarene demoniac. The committee decided that the de demonic influence over the demonized man was so strong that they would keep the term demon possessed in that instance, but they might get rid of it in a future revision. Some people say the demoniac ran to Jesus and bowed before him and that Jesus only cast demons out of people who wanted them out. Others say it was the demon through the man's body. Even if it was the demon, I still don't think we can know whether the demonized man wanted the demons out. In this incident with the demonic legion situation, I wouldn't deduce anything from that text about this man's repentance or level of faith. He definitely believed afterwards it was probably the demon that knew Jesus was the Messiah and saying that Peter and Mary, who were not indwelt by the Holy Spirit, both knew by a supernatural revelation that Jesus was the Messiah. Was it the demons or the man throwing themselves at Jesus' feet? Probably the demons, but I can't say with absolute certainty. I wouldn't deduce anything from this passage about whether this guy was a believer or whether someone in this state could be a believer. The scripture doesn't say anything, so I'm not comfortable with making any conclusions about that. It's better to say nothing where scripture itself says nothing. Demonization seems to affect the physical, mental, and volitional capabilities of the person. However, the individual who is the victim of demons usually can and must exercise their will as far as they have the power to do so toward God and against the evil spirits. Words like oppress, or harassed, or attacked, or tempted aren't necessarily suitable for describing the internal inhabiting influence of demonization, although some really good modern Bible translations like the ESV Bible use the term demon oppressed to refer to the condition of a person who is inhabited by demons. The term oppressed is not perfectly accurate, although I do prefer it to the term possessed. Actually, you could distinguish between external oppression versus internal oppression. External harassment versus internal harassment. External influence versus internal influence. So terms like oppression might be okay, but those terms describe something more general than inhabitation, influence, or demonization. So the term oppressed um, could be used to refer to either internal or external influence. Actually, as I said earlier, um, Peter, Peter said in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, that Jesus went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil. But we know from the gospel accounts that almost always, if not always, that involved casting indwelling demons out of a person. And let me give you two reasons why this is true. Number one, there's no example in all of scripture of a believer in Jesus Christ being possessed by a demon after being a converted Christian. Certainly before conversion, but never after. Another point they'll make is that there is no instruction in scripture to cast demons out of believers, and it's true. There are no clear biblical texts instructing Christians to cast demons out of believers. The problem with this argument is that neither does scripture ever instruct us to cast demons out of unbelievers. There are biblical texts where Jesus told his disciples to teach other believers to obey everything he commanded them, which we know involved casting out demons. But Jesus never told his disciples to cast demons out of unbelievers. He simply told them to cast demons out of people. He didn't make a clear distinction between believers and unbelievers in respect to this issue. So I think people who make that argument are committing a logical fallacy here. They'll also say there are no examples after Pentecost where a true believer is inhabited by a demon and therefore has to have a demon cast out of them. Again, the problem is that neither are there clear examples where unbelievers are inhabited by demons, and therefore need to have demons cast out of them. Rather, there are clear texts where people have demons and need to have them cast out. Not believers or unbelievers, just people. It doesn't tell us to cast demons out of believers or unbelievers, it just tells us to cast demons out of people. It doesn't give us examples of casting demons out of believers or unbelievers. It just gives us examples of casting demons out of people. I think that's because it was a non-issue. Some people might say the Bible never talks about casting demons out of believers, and that is an argument from silence, but arguments from silence aren't all bad. If you're expecting gunshots and they don't come, then that's quite telling, and in that case, you can make an argument from silence. The problem with this situation is we can put that in the reverse. What passage clearly says they cast demons out of unbelievers? 
I'm also waiting for the gunshots and I'm not hearing them. I think we could assume many of the people who had demons cast out of them were unbelievers, but it doesn't clearly say that. It just says they cast demons out of people. And from the perspective of the New Testament writers, whether it was a believer or an unbeliever was irrelevant, they just believed people could have demons. Whether that person was a believer or not was not important because it was possible for anyone to have demons. The most important thing is to get the demons out of the person. There is one last point, and it will sound a bit like I'm repeating myself. They'll specifically say there is no epistle instructing believers to cast demons out of each other. And you'd think that someone would have written something about this if believers did cast demons out of each other in the, in the early church. In response to that, I'd like to point out that there isn't an epistle instructing believers to cast demons out of anyone, for that matter. Not even unbelievers. Not even people. And yet this was part of the commission. There are probably no epistles telling believers to cast demons out of each other because a lot of the people in the New, the New Testament writers wrote to already had demons cast out of them when they came to the Christ, and they probably knew all about deliverance because it would have been one of the first things they experienced when they came to Christ. The early church was efficient in getting on and casting demons out of new believers. There is also only one New Testament epistle instructing believers to pray for other believers to be healed, which is in James chapter 5. And you'd think they'd address that a bit more, but they don't. And it doesn't mean they didn't do it. I think these people would have already known about deliverance. They already experienced deliverance, and I think they did deliverance ministry mainly on new believers. If it was anything like modern day deliverance, then there is almost no need to tell these people to get a demon of lust or a demon of anger cast out of them. Their experience already told them that. Deliverance ministry was one of the first things they experienced when they be when becoming believers. Paul is writing to people who are already believers. People who are in the early church, unlike today, had experienced deliverance from the start of their walk. People who are familiar with deliverance don't often need to be told they can get a demon of addiction cast out of them because they've experienced that. And unfortunately, they then start to think it's the solution to every sinful urge. So Far more often with those people, it's the opposite. Their legitimate experience with deliverance leads them to wrong, wrongly blame everything on demons. So far more often, you need to teach them about exercising their will to put to death the deeds of the flesh. On that same note, there are warnings of all kinds in scripture, but never a warning to not be possessed by demons. If believers could be possessed, you'd think God would have warned us about it, but he doesn't. In Ephesians 4, verses 17 to 27, all writing to believers says the following. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And then he says this, and give no opportunity to the devil. Believers are told not to provide an opportunity for the devil. The context of this verse links this with sinful actions and sinful behavior. People are the source of their own sinful behavior, but that sinful behavior can open a door for the devil. And once the devil gains access, even though he can't cause you to sin, he can put diesel on the flames, making it a whole lot more difficult to put to death those sinful urges and desires as you usually would by just exercising your will. Give no opportunity to the devil. The word translated opportunity can also be translated as a foothold or a place of habitation. This is the Greek word topos. This word can be used 
often in the New Testament to describe either internal or external habitable space. The passage is talking about things like anger, falsehood, greed, impurity, and then it's saying, don't give a place to the devil. Where do these things come from? Out of your heart. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, Jesus explains that these things that defile come out of the heart. In Acts chapter 5, verse 3, Peter said to Ananias after he lied to the Holy Spirit, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Where does anger come from? Your mind, your will, your emotions inside you. Where is the place of habitation provided? That's where the place of habitation is provided, inside you. In a couple of instances where Topos refers to an opportunity is uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 19, and Hebrews chapter 12, verse 17. But I think the concept of inhabitable space is more appropriate in the context of Ephesians for referring to spiritual powers and realities. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 22 says, In him you also are being built into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Ephesians 3 17 says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Ephesians 3 19 says that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. There is this idea of dwelling and habitation and filling. With the verses in Ephesians that talk about being filled with the Spirit and about Christ dwelling in your hearts, And when read in context, it's clear that this is not automatic or unconditional. Then you make Ephesians 4, then you have Ephesians 4 verse 27 says, give no place to the devil. So I think inhabitation makes more sense with this theme in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17, Paul writes an intercessory prayer uh, that Christ would dwell in the hearts of these believers through faith. These people were already believers, so clearly Christ already dwelled in their hearts, but it's about Christ filling every room in their heart. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27 talks about the inner depths of the heart or the rooms of the heart. Ephesians 4, 27 makes more sense in the understanding of inhabitable space. They should not give inhabitable space in themselves for a demonic spirit to occupy through sin. There are multiple rooms in the heart. After conversion, Jesus takes up residence in our heart, progressively asserting his influence and lordship over each room in the house as we progress in our Christian life and undergo sanctification. Jesus may be in the lounge, but there may be a demon hiding in one of the bedrooms. Jesus wants to remove all the defilements and illegal occupants. The way he does this may be through our confessing sin and administering of deliverance by other believers. This also could explain how both the Holy Spirit and a demon can dwell in a believer, each in different rooms at the same time. Some people might say Paul is not referring to inhabited space in an individual, but rather inhabited space among the group of group of people. So the devil may not reside inside a person, but just around a group. However, the sinful activities described here are things individuals do and still wrong when an individual does them. So Paul, I believe, is speaking to individuals as much as to the collective group. And the term devil refers to Satan himself. But it could also be used as a general term for anything in Satan's domain. When Jesus was casting out regular demons, he referred to it as driving out Satan. When we refer to an open door for the devil, we may not be referring literally to the devil himself, but anything demonic, anything in Satan's realm. And while some people believe Christians can walk away from their eternal salvation by persisting in deliberate flagrant sin, or else prove they were never truly saved in the first place, most people would agree that they don't lose their eternal self and salvation just because they commit a one-time grievous sin. Deliverance ministries will usually agree that with that, but they also understand that a one-time grievous sin is an open door for a demon to inhabit someone. However, I will say, in the context of this passage, it doesn't say that only grievous sin can provide a foothold for the devil. It says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. You may hold a grudge for a couple of days, and in doing so, you're providing a space for the enemy. That doesn't guarantee demons will enter you, but it's an open door, and if demons do enter you, that doesn't mean you'll immediately become like the demoniac with the legion in him, hanging out in the tombs, crying out and cutting yourself. 
it doesn't mean you'll immediately become a meat puppet who is under the absolute constant control of the demonic spirit. But by holding on to anger for more than a day, you may be opening yourself up to a mild level of internal demonic oppression. I don't think opening a door to a demonic spirit necessarily means the person has lost their salvation, their eternal salvation, or that they were never truly a believer. The evidence for this will be whether they are willing to take the steps to remove this stuff. A topos is also a military foothold in a battle, a place from which they can carry out further warfare. It simply describes having gained a vantage point from which the demon has a level of control and might gain more ground or eventually the entire battle. This could be giving an area of your life over to some control of the devil, giving ground to the devil. So this is inhabitation and influence with a level of control. It doesn't necessarily mean the demon totally controls, totally possesses, or therefore owns the person. This means giving a place to the devil, giving him a place of influence within you, giving the devil a foothold is not the same as giving him the entire war or even the entire battle. So that would indicate to me that if a demon is able to enter a believer because of some sin that that does not necessarily mean that they've given their entire soul to Satan. The devil may have gained an internal level of control, but he has not taken the entire battlefield or won the entire battle. He has not taken over the entire person or won ownership of that person's soul. We must be careful not to understate or overstate what it means for the devil to gain a foothold. So Paul isn't necessarily concerned about these believers losing their eternal salvation or stepping out of the faith at this point, based on what he is warning them about in this passage. At this stage, he is concerned about them getting demonized on some level and to a degree where they could be further afflicted. As I said before, I would also understand from this that if a believer sins, maybe they have improper thoughts or something along those lines. That doesn't mean that if the demon enters them, they'll instantly be like the legion demoniac in the terms cutting themselves and crying out like a maniac. Sin does provide an opportunity or a foothold to the devil. And if the devil does gain access by taking control or you, you or usurping his influence, it's, it's usually a progressive thing. From a warfare perspective, if you want to take a foothold back, you can't just walk up to it and chuck your flag on the ground and say, this is my ground. You obviously have to drive the enemy off that ground first, and they might not want to leave. There may be a battle, and that's why you have to drive them out, and this involves driving out demons. There is a well-known um, early church document known as the Shepherd of Hermas, and I don't, I don't agree with everything in this document. I mean, obviously, there's a reason why it's not in the canon of Scripture, but the writer used the Greek word topos to describe the possibility of the devil finding a place in a believer who doesn't stand strong, and therefore the devil enters them and then enslaves them. In some ways, it would seem, based on what he is writing about, and based on his his language, that he's alluding to this passage in Ephesians chapter 4 about giving no place to the devil, and it indicates that he understood this passage to include the possibility of the devil actually entering a believer and enslaving them in some area of their life. He also talks about how the devil enters because he finds the believer partially empty, which fits quite well with what I've been talking about to do with the theme in Ephesians of believers not just being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but how they should also be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, of Paul praying that Jesus dwell in their hearts, and if they don't fully do this, they could give a place of habitation to the devil. I also think from a historical interpretation perspective, it pushes back against the view that a believer can't be partially filled with the Holy Spirit and with demons at the same time. For now, I just want to make the point that based on both historical uh, biblical and historical interpretation, I really do think that Ephesians 4 is describing the possibility of demons being able to inhabit a Christian if they are given a foothold. In the area of whether or not a believer can have a demon, it is important to cover 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2-4. to four. For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. The Corinthians were spirit-baptized, charismatic Christians who were tolerating the presence and influence of false teachers who were energized by demons. 
This shows born again, spirit baptized believers can open the door to demons. And you see, I'm not saying this to make any sort of statement about what I may or may not believe about the baptism and the Holy Spirit. That's another topic for another time. I'm pointing this out so that any charismatic or Pentecostal Christians can realize that the possibility of demonization can include them just as much as any other Christian. Some people will say that spirit here refers to a disposition, but I think it's referring to a demon. The context talks about Satan as the serpent that deceived Eve. I think the satanic realm is in view here. Paul is warning believers of the very real possibility that they could receive a false spirit, a demon. I think this is clearly warning that believers can become demonized or inhabited by demons in the same way they received Jesus with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. However, this doesn't answer the question of whether they remain eternally saved. In this case, a believer may be walking away from their salvation, but I can't pin that on the fact they've opened themselves up to a demon because in this specific situation, the issue is more than that. It's paired with the fact that they're also embracing a false Jesus and a false gospel, which is a salvation issue. What if a believer opened an entry point for a demon through some other area, but wasn't adhering to a false gospel or a false Jesus? Would that be a different story? Would that be an eternal salvation issue? For now, I do conclude from this that someone can be born again and then later receive a false spirit. However, there is more to address. And if a believer turns aside to a false gospel and receives a false spirit, then later repents, does the demon leave them automatically? Or do they have to get someone to cast it out? And if that's the case, is their salvation restored to them the moment they realize the error and repent? Or is it restored to them later after the demon is cast out? What if they die between the moment they repent and the moment the demon is cast out? That's another reason why I don't interpret passages like the following to teach that a believer cannot later receive a false spirit. Second uh, Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, God did not give you a spirit of fear. Romans 8, verse 15 to 16, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Or 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. And obviously, I covered these passages earlier, but you see where I'm coming from. I obviously, because of 2 Corinthians 11, I don't interpret these passages to mean that a believer can't later open a door for a demonic spirit. Paul wrote to the Galatian Christians when they were going back to observing the law of Moses. And in chapter 4 and verse 3, in the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. With this verse, the footnotes in many Bibles say elemental spirits of the world. And the same with verses 8 to 9, where Paul says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more. Through this entire section of Galatians, chapter 4, verses 1 to 10, Paul was making it clear that the Galatian Christians were in danger of becoming enslaved again to the elemental spirits of the universe. The word translated elemental spirits is the word stoikion. This word is not translated as demon or spirit, but it is a word used to describe a form of angelic power similar to the principalities and powers described in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. The elemental spirits and the principalities and powers are basically the same thing. Further, when Paul uses the word stoikion, he describes them as beings that by nature are no gods in chapter 4, verse 8. In other words, these are living spiritual entities. And he says that these elemental spirits are weak and beggarly. The Greek word for beggarly is tokos, which according to Thayer's lexicon means one who slinks and crouches, roving about in wretchedness, a remarkably accurate description of evil spirits. So Paul is saying that the Galatians, before they knew Christ, were enslaved to these demonic creatures and that, and that some of them were currently being bewitched back into the same demonic slavery. Can one who is a Christian become bewitched and recaptured by the demonic forces which controlled him 
before he became a Christian. And Paul says, yes, these Gentile believers were in bondage in the past to the elemental spirits before they became believers. Paul is concerned that they will become re-enslaved to these spirits, not primarily through false gods and idolatry like they were last time, but through coming under the law and various Jewish sectarian practices like ritual laws. The following is some unclear scripture, but still important that I cover. First Timothy chapter three, verse seven, Paul tells Timothy a new convert shouldn't become an overseer because they're more susceptible to pride and falling into the snare of the devil. It's unclear whether or not this is referring to demonization, but it's clear that a believer can be trapped and therefore enslaved by Satan. Number two, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 16 says, What partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Simply put, the Holy Spirit doesn't do roommates. How can demons inhabit the temple of the Holy Spirit? Doesn't this prove that Christians can't have demons? To many Christians, the idea sounds ridiculous. Well, hear me out on this. The body of a believer is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 to 20 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. The idea is drawing on Old Testament imagery, which, if anything, does not rule out the possibility of demonization in Christians. The Bible teaches that when people worship idols, they are actually worshiping demons. Idols represent demons. There were abominations done in the Old Testament temple. King Josiah found idols in the temple. He renewed the covenant with God and found everything in there. King Manasseh set up idols in the temple. Surprisingly, in spite of all this, the Lord's presence and glory did not depart from the temple until around the time of the Babylonian captivity in Ezekiel chapter 10. Obviously, the Holy Spirit dwelt in the Old Testament temple even while there were idols, demons, in it at the same time. This does not mean the Holy Spirit was affirming the idolatry. Also, I'm not saying that a sincere believer having demons that still need to be cast out is as bad as the people of Israel rebelliously, deliberately bringing idols into the temple, or that all demonized believers are guilty of idolatry. I am saying that if it is possible for the Holy Spirit to inhabit the Old Testament temple at the same time as idols that represent demons and at the same time as abominations are done in the temple and not depart until a long time later, then I see no reason why the fact that our bodies being temples of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit dwells, would in itself rule out the possibility that demons could inhabit our temples at the same time. The preceding verses in 1 Corinthians say the following, beginning in verse, um, verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. The primary issue being dealt with in this passage is that a believer should not engage in sexual immorality because their body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and sexual sin defiles the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to hear that again. Sexual sin defiles the temple of the Holy Spirit, but it does not cause the temple of the Holy Spirit to cease being the temple of the Holy Spirit. Neither does it say that because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that it cannot be defiled. 1 Corinthians 6.15 doesn't say it is not possible to sleep with a prostitute or to be joined to a prostitute because our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit's presence in us or our being the temple of the Holy Spirit will automatically stop us doing that. In fact, the passage is literally saying that it is possible for believers to defile the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
Paul is saying that because our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, we should not sleep with a prostitute, but we're well capable of doing it. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control, but that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit takes control of us. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we should not allow demons to defile our body by, by inhabiting it. But that doesn't preclude the possibility if we open the door. Some people will say that this scripture says flee from sexual immorality. It doesn't say if you have a demon of lust to cast it out. Obviously, I agree. But is this talking about flee from it before it gets you? Before you've opened the door to the demon? What if you've already opened the door to a spirit of lust and it's already entered you? I've heard people say things like, Surely the Holy Spirit will not allow a demon to inhabit the same person he is indwelling, as if it doesn't need a biblical backup. It's just assumed. Or they'll say something like, it is unthinkable that God would allow one of his children who he purchased with the blood of Christ and made into a new creation to be inhabited and influenced by a demon. Neither of these statements are based on clear arguments. They assume things and they jump to conclusions. People say Christians can't have demons because a believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit and they say light and darkness cannot coexist, cannot dwell together or cannot dwell in the same vessel. They base this off 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, where it says light has no communion with darkness. But the context is talking about a believer being yoked to an unbeliever. And this isn't saying that it's not possible to be yoked to an unbeliever. It is forbidding being yoked to an unbeliever, even though it's possible. Nothing indicates that the Holy Spirit and demons are having communion together by inhabiting the same body. People confuse communion with cohabitation. Even then, the word cohabit can have a connotation associated with a sexual relationship. It sort of mixes the idea of dwelling together and being in a sexual relationship. The passage says they do not have communion. It does not answer whether they can inhabit the same space. Inhabiting the same space does not necessarily mean they're on the same side in harmony, harmony together or having communion or having a relationship. The word cohabit is spatial terminology. And while it's true that demons do inhabit um, physical bodies, they are themselves non-physical beings, which makes this more abstract. Also, the word communion, which is used in this verse, is not the same as coexistence or cohabitation. A believer and an unbeliever can coexist in the same space or even live in the same building without having communion together. People wrongly assume that because the Holy Spirit and a demon inhabit the same space or the same body, that they are therefore in harmony together. Furthermore, in the context, Paul isn't saying it is impossible for believers to be yoked in fellowship with evil or with the unbeliever. Rather, he is saying that we shouldn't do it, even though we're well capable of it. This passage in 2 Corinthians 6 also says, what accord has Christ with Belial, not Christ with the devil? My point is that this is alluding to the Christian who is the temple of the Holy Spirit being yoked to a pagan person who is a temple for the god or demon Belial. It's talking about Christians being yoked to other people. However, that does indicate and contrast that an unbelieving idolater is a temple for a demon. But again, that doesn't necessarily mean that a demon cannot inhabit a Christian. That would be an argument from silence. As we've covered before, when we've talked about the temple, the Old Testament temple was not a pagan temple. But they did wrongfully have idols in there at various times while the Holy Spirit still inhabited the temple. Besides, Paul isn't saying it's not possible for us to be yoked to an unbeliever. He's saying we shouldn't be yoked to an unbeliever. I will also point out that the Holy Spirit inhabits our bodies, even though we have a fleshly sin nature. Now, that doesn't mean he's in harmony or in communion with our flesh. They're directly opposed to each other, even though they're in the same body. Some people say it's unlikely that the Holy Spirit would want to inhabit the same space as a demon or share the same house as a demon. I think that's true, but I also acknowledge that the Holy Spirit chooses to share the same body as our sinful flesh, even though it grieves him and it's contrary to who he is. 
A believer having a demon and the Holy Spirit at the same time is no different to the Holy Spirit being in the same body as the flesh. The only difference is that the biblical method for dealing with a demonic spirit is for the Holy Spirit to enable a believer to drive the demons, drive out the demons as opposed to exercising our will to progressively and continually put to death the deeds of the flesh, which can involve a struggle. The Holy Spirit's presence does empower a believer to progressively put to death the deeds of the flesh, but he doesn't automatically or instantaneously get rid of the flesh that is also inside you, and the flesh is just as evil and wicked as a demon. For those who can't understand the Holy Spirit dwelling in the same body as an unclean spirit, then please explain why don't you have issues with him dwelling in the same body as a Christian who doesn't have a demon. Christians who don't have demons still have a sin nature, sinful flesh. It's just as corrupt and unholy as a demon. Sin, which is the evil inclination, a structure of the present evil age, can inhabit and influence the body of a Christian, even reign in their body, while the Holy Spirit dwells in their at the same time. So why would it wouldn't it be possible for a Christian to yield to the influence of a demon in the same way Christians can yield to the influence or power of sin and yet the Holy Spirit could still dwell in them? 1 John 5:18 says strongly the evil one does not touch him who is born of God. One of the most well-known verses used in opposition to the idea that Christians can have demons is 1 John 5, 18. It says, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. For he who has been born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. The idea is that if Satan cannot so much as touch a true believer, then how could we even imagine the idea of a demon inhabiting a believer? The word touch means to fasten to, or grasp, which still describes something outward. But even then, I would hesitate to use this verse as a proof that Christians cannot be attacked by Satan in any sense. According to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it is possible to be devoured by the devil. That's why it says that we have to be sober and vigilant. In Revelation 2, verse 10, Jesus was addressing one of the faithful churches, which had nothing to repent of, and he said that Satan was going to imprison and even kill some of them. He told these believers to be faithful to death, so clearly believers can be outwardly touched by Satan if we define the term touch in a very general sense. So that can't be what this verse is saying, and I would also therefore say this verse is irrelevant to demonic inhabitation. It doesn't speak into the subject of demonization. If the non-touching which is described is something outward, yet isn't ruling out all outward attacks, then what is it describing? According to William Vine, the meaning of Satan not being able to touch the believer is that Satan cannot assault the believer in order to, to sever the vital union between Christ and the believer. I would say it means Satan cannot grasp or assault the true believer so as to take eternal life from them or take them out of Christ's grasp. Satan cannot rob a believer of this eternal salvation. He cannot grasp so as to destroy the life of the believer. Whether they can be inhabited and oppressed by a demon is a whole other story, and whether a believer can choose to walk away from their eternal salvation is also another discussion altogether. And Colossians 1.13 says, We've been rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of God's Son. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, Paul, writing to believers, says that God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So some translations translate this as power. So they translate it, um, translate this as he has delivered us from the power of darkness. This passage does not use the Greek word dunamis, which would be translated as power. And that means inherent power or ability rather than authority or right to do something. Instead, it is the Greek word exousia, which I think should say either domain, authority, jurisdiction, or right to do something. So this is more of a legal term, not a necessarily power or influence. So God has delivered us from the authority of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. This describes a transference from the authority or domain of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son. The question isn't whether you have been transferred into the kingdom of Jesus. If you're a believer, you have been transferred. The question is, 
Is it possible to carry critters over with you? Is it possible to carry demonic critters over with you? And I don't think this verse clearly answers that question. I would also make the point that you may be outside of someone else's domain or legitimate jurisdiction, but they may still illegitimately try to take you captive, captive because they saw a vulnerability or an open door. Other nations take prisoners of war. Legally, a believer is under God's jurisdiction. They don't legitimately belong to the enemy. But whether a demon can influence them, inhabit them, or hold them captive in some area of their life when given an entry point is a different issue. Luke chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus told the 70 disciples, Behold, I give you authority, exousia, to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power or dunamis of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Authority to trample on the power of the enemy. It distinguishes the two. They were not under the authority of the enemy because they now had authority to trample on the enemy's power. Notice, having authority to trample over all the power of the enemy doesn't automatically eliminate the existence or activity of Satan's power. You still have to trample on his power Authority is almost a legal or positional thing. So when I read Colossians 1 verses 13 to 14, I don't assume that our having come out from the authority of darkness automatically eliminates the possibility of the power of darkness existing or seeking to be active in our lives. So you tell me, can you be the temple of the Spirit of God, protected from the evil one, rescued from the domain of darkness, and then be controlled by demonic possession? Absolutely not. Those who are possessed by demons are without Christ. These are some results when demonization in Christians is denied. All problems are said to be due to the person not being surrendered enough. The old sin nature becomes the scapegoat in a wall which the demons can hide behind. All personality quirks and all characteristics are thought to be unchangeable. The person may eventually yield to the pressures which are being caused by the demons, thinking they can't help themselves and that's just the way they are. Ultimately, despair and hopelessness are fostered within the demonized person. On the other hand, the person may use their energy, all their energy and strength to suppress the inward pressures and urges being caused by the demons and waste spiritual energy that could be used more effectively for the Lord. Furthermore, demons can be given grounds to stay when a person sits under the teaching that denies a Christian can have a demon. The demonized Christian is being held in a life of ongoing demonic influence with the unnecessary suffering that goes with it when it's actually God's will to set them free. On One of the other dangers of denying Christians can have demons is not denying that the person's issues are demonic and leaving them oppressed, but acknowledging the person has demons and then therefore concluding that the demonized believer is not a true believer. Some people in concluding this cut off fellowship and then are fearful of the demonized person. So there's a lot of hurtful rejection. And I think if someone is deliberately or carelessly continuing sin or in some heresy, then maybe their salvation is in question. But if they trust in Jesus and they desire to and crave freedom, then we need to be careful calling into question their salvation, especially a weak believer. It can be very harmful and damaging. And they are in need of the gospel and prayer. We ought to plead for their souls, pray for their souls, and preach the truth that God might grant them repentance and set them free from the bondage of demonic darkness. In all honesty, I do like the very last thing he said. I think Costi genuinely cares about people's souls, and I appreciate the fact that he doesn't deny the existence of demonic bondage and I could tell by the way he finished his video that he really does care about people getting set free from demonic darkness. In many ways I like Kosti and I like that he preaches a solid gospel message of Jesus dying for our sin and being raised from the dead and that salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. However, I obviously find myself disagreeing with almost everything else in that video. What I saw in that video are the typical arguments that I often hear people use to say that a Christian cannot be demonized. Now he used the term demon possession. Obviously I believe Christians cannot be demon possessed, if by that you mean owned by a demon. But I think it's pretty obvious that when Costi is using the term demon possessed, he is including what the New Testament describes when demons inhabit an individual and internally oppress them and internally influence them and internally exercise varying degrees of control or domination. 
And don't get me wrong, I don't think any true Christian who is demonized will want to stay demonized or that they will stay demonized. I think if they're demonized, they will come to recognize a demonic struggle in their life and go on to get the demons cast out. The thing is, you know, we see these videos on YouTube exposing flaky, hyper charismatic preaching. And I don't have a problem with that. But how often do we see videos confronting the way some cessationist preachers can whitewash some of these subjects like this one? That's why I chose to do this video. I don't have a problem with Costi Hin, and I'm not being disingenuous when I say that. There's probably a lot you can learn off him. And even if you disagree with him or me, it's good to be aware of other perspectives so that you don't get stuck in your own theological echo chamber. But I do strongly disagree with Costi on this subject, and I wanted to do this video to contrast the two perspectives. If you found this video helpful, or you have something to add, then feel free to leave a comment. Also hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the bell to receive notifications. Until next time, thank you for listening, and may God bless you.